Good evening and welcome to uh, our Bible study tonight in Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 37. We're going to be going over quite a bit of information tonight. Not a whole lot as far as uh, quantity, but you're going to deal with some quant uh, some content. Uh, definitely the amount that's in there is going to be something to talk about. As we're going to be following up on our lesson from uh, last time we got together and we studied the first part of Acts chapter 4 and where we talked about how uh, Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin and some of the information that they had to go through and, uh, and the hoops they had to jump through. Unfortunately, the way it was and the way it was set up, they wanted to see them fail. They wanted to see these men uh, brought before the Sanhedrin and, and end up becoming useless. But the thing was, God had bigger plans for it. And that's kind of how God works with us. Uh, when, we think we, when we think we're at our lowest, God will always find a way to pick us up. And that is exactly what he's done here in uh, Acts chapter 4. I want to wish you all a happy evening. Glad to see people out and about. And uh, hope we can study the Word together and have some good times and fellowship. Please be in prayer for uh, one another during these difficult days. Uh, I know that there are still people that are messing, that are still dealing with this mess of a virus going around, and we want to be able to pray for and encourage them. We've had some folks that have lost loved ones and friends that are going through some difficult times with cancer and uh, other illnesses, so we want to be in prayer for them uh, and definitely be in prayer for all those that are hurting in these days and this time. Um, thank you again for tuning in with us. Uh, if you are interested in coming and assembling in the name of Jesus, if you're in the uh, Greene County area, by all means you can visit us at the Mount Gilead Christian Church. That is out on Skid House Branch Road out there right along the border of Greene County and Adair County. We'd love to have you out that way. Service starts at 9.30 a.m. Central Time. Or if you're closer to the Greensburg town there, you can always step over there across from the high school at the Greensburg Christian Church. Our services there start at 10 a.m. for Sunday school and 11 a.m. for worship. We'd encourage you all to come on out and be a part of that. Love to see you all out there and uh, come worship with us. We'd love to fellowship with you. As I say before, and as you'll hear many times when I'm talking to folks, we're a big family. All of us are. And we want to encourage you to be a part of that family as well. All right, guys, let's get on into the scripture here. We'll look and see what God's Word says in some detail here. All right, let's start with verse 23 of Acts chapter 4. I'll be reading out of the English Standard Version. So here we go. When they were released, excuse me here, there we go. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voice together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth, and the sea and everything in them, who thought the who through uh, the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, 
but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many were owners of land or house, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Feet. Now, where we're going to be starting off here is we're going to be looking at the area where they're coming out of the temple complex. They're coming together with the saints that are there with them. They have gone. They've been released by the chief priests and the elders. They have been scolded and told, don't you preach this name Jesus. Because if you preach this name Jesus, you're going to get in a world of trouble. You're going to end up it's going to end up costing you everything. We talked about that this morning, didn't we? We talked about how discipleship costs us everything. It can cost us our family. It can cost us our job. It can cost us everything that we think is important. And a lot of people say, well, you don't want to be so fervent with Jesus that you end up sacrificing your family or you don't want to sacrifice your job. Jesus says the opposite. He said, if you're unwilling to give up your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, you know, very much yourself, if you're unwilling to do that to be my disciple, you can't follow me. Now, a lot of people take that the wrong way. They think, well, if that's what Jesus expects. I'm not going to give it to him. But what Jesus does expect is that we go and we give ourselves to him. Once we give ourselves to him, he is going to be so reflective in us that our families are going to see the change in us. Now, our moms, our dads, our brothers, and our sisters, all those folks may and or may not agree with it. They may like it. They may not. And if they do agree with it, amen, that's wonderful. Keep encouraging them through the Spirit and through the Lord. Keep letting Jesus be seen in you. But if they go and they say, well, I, you're just too much for me, pray for them but continue to represent the Lord that saved your soul. And that's what Jesus is saying here, and that's exactly what Peter and John have done. They have said, you know, we've went through this. We've suffered in the name of Jesus, but you know something? We're not going to quit preaching him. We're going to keep on praising the Lord. We're going to keep on testifying the name of Jesus Christ, and we're going to take time to know Jesus Christ. And that's where we're going to be talking now. Sanhedrin was unable to do anything at this time to the apostles besides threaten them because the people were glorifying God. And with that, with all the miracles that had been done and especially the miracle of the uh, lame man walking, they couldn't say anything. There was no basis in which the Sanhedrin could detain Peter and John because the healing glorified God. And so that's where we pick up here. Once Peter and John were released, they went back to their own company and they reported all the things that had happened to them and what happened in front of the chief priests and the elders that said to them. As we saw last time, it was, it was not unreasonable to think that when the scripture says the chief priests threatened Peter and John, that they, were, that they had threatened the loss of their lives. He said, you, will, you know, basically, essentially, you're going to die. You will die if you keep doing this. It's going to happen. The Sanhedrin had, pre had repeatedly warned them to no longer preach and teach in the name of Jesus. How frightening it must have been for the rest to hear this when Peter and John came in. All the other folks that had been assembled there, all the other apostles, all the other saints who were there serving and preaching and living by Jesus, you imagine the fear that may have gripped them. But one of the great things was this. One of the great things was this. It is evident that the company of believers were, may have been unnerved by hearing that, but it is so powerful to see what happens with John and Peter 
sovereign Lord who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in it, who through the mouth of your father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the, the rulers are gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Peter and John take this time to respond to that fear. First, the whole company turns to God in prayer. They don't go and care. They don't get upset. They don't get worried and let fear contain them. They don't shut themselves in. Rather, they go to the source of their strength, the very source of their strength, which is the Lord. And it's quite evident here that they wanted to be able to give God their need, their problem. And God was quick to rectify, to heal, and to build them up. He encouraged them through the prayer, through the assembly, through all that was going on. There was this passion and spirit that evaded and, and, just, and it just came in and just and pulled them in and pulled them together. Carefully notice how these disciples responded to what the Sanhedrin has done. Their response is not the response I believe most of us would have expressed. They go and they pray. They ask for God's authority in the world. The company recognizes that this is the fulfillment of what David had said in Psalm 2. Notice that their notice their that their great faith by quoting that psalm, that they're saying that what leaders of the Jews and the Romans are doing in vain and in worthless. They have gathered themselves together against the plans of the Lord, and it will fail. It will fail. And by quoting that psalm and by showing them that they were going to win this war, that this was going to be something that built them and instructed them and helped them and encouraged them, it was something that was going to make them whole. It was something that God had planned and predetermined. This was something that through Jesus, that through his plan of salvation was bound to happen. There were going to be people that would go against Jesus Christ. And obviously the Sanhedrin had already placed themselves against Christ. Now here they are again doing the exact same thing. They're going against Christ. Yet all of what has happened thus far has been according to God's plan deter uh, determined from the very beginning. And second, I want you to look at verse 29. As the company of believers asked the Lord to look upon their threats and grant the disciples boldness, boldness to continue to speak the word of God and perform miracles as was performed on the lame man. After praying this, the place was shaken. Now, I think there are times when there are people that get really upset with the idea of allowing the Spirit to command. I think we in the Christian church do have a tendency to get a little nervous when we hear about the Holy Spirit going and shaking the place. But the truth is, it's scriptural. You see, the Holy Spirit who resides in us, He who resides within us, compels us to be awakened, to go and be shaken in times of need. When it looks like it is at its darkest is when God is going to shine His brightest. When we are allowing God to work, when we are going before the Lord, look at what they did. They went, they got on their knees, and they prayed to God that this would be done in His will, not their will, not the way of the church, not the way of the building, not the way of man, but through God and through His plan. It is only through His plan that we can have hope, that we can have assurance, strength to be built up, to be brought together. And that is that spirit that is shaking in them. This morning at uh, Greensburg, we had just, you know, after 
we went through the service and after we had so much good fellowship and good time together you know here we were we were closing things up we were wrapping things up i was telling everybody bye we love you we're praying for you and we had two folks right there who had been members of that church for years come up and say we just want to rededicate ourselves to jesus why because the spirit shook them you see that's what happens when the spirit works in us the spirit shakes us i was in shock <laughs> it wasn't the fact that they had come up and just said hey we want to rededicate ourselves to jesus it was just like wow the spirit moves i was moved i was shaking in that way because i was like mercy god you're working and I know you're working because I see it in the people that are here. We have people talking and sharing at the end, praising God, giving God glory, shouting amen. And it wasn't just some show. It was the camaraderie of family. When we assemble in like precious faith, when we come together and we pray, when we come together and allow the Spirit to work within us and to praise God as we are instructed, the great gift of that is going to be the resounding shaking of the body. The body is going to go and grow. They're going to react. And yes, they are going to give God their best. Now, I know a lot of people just get uncomfortable with the Spirit. Now, I'm not saying we're going to start doing pew jumping and all that, but what I say is this. When the Spirit ignites within our hearts, when God's Word brings about that awakening, that growing, that loving, that passion, and we start connecting together, and we love God and we love one another, and we allow His Spirit to work. After praying this, the place was shaken. It was filled with the Spirit, and they continued to speak the Word of God boldly. This morning, as we left the church, the building, that is, when we left the building, the church exited. The people exited. The church left the building. And when they left the building, what they did was they allowed the Spirit to work, to guide, and to direct as he saw fit, and they will continue to boldly preach the word because God's Spirit is with them. I recognize that we're not going to do everything perfect, that we're still going to get tempted to fall into sin. But what we do is we keep relying on God, on Jesus, on the Spirit that dwells within us and keep pressing on toward the prize ahead to be unshaken by the way of this world and to be shaken by the Spirit and allow Him to guide our words, our deeds, our actions, our all. And that means we've got to trust God. There's much to be impressed with from what took place in these verses. I want us to see the boldness this company of believers had to trust God. Not they do, you know, Don't focus on the boldness that God offered them once they prayed. Rather, I want you to look at the boldness, the boldness these Christians had to trust God to take care of this situation. They trusted God to take care of the situation. Do we trust God to take care of the situations? You see, the disciples have their lives on the line if they continue going and serving God and preaching in the name of Jesus. The disciples do not pray that God remove these evil, wicked leaders so that they can safely continue preaching and teaching. Oh, no, 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 no. The disciples did not give up and declare that, well, we've done all we can do. Well, I, guess, I guess we'll go ahead and put it to the side. No. Instead, they prayed to God and left it in His hands. Do you and I have that same kind of boldness to trust the Lord? And even in situations where we think that we can do it, or maybe we should back away and just leave well enough alone and, and, and ignore and, oh, well, you know, God's will is, you know, I don't want to tempt God. If you're preaching God's word, you're not tempting God. You're following God. 
Well, what about all these wicked people that are out in the world that are going to want to destroy us or, or, or make us feel bad or, or, or just want to shut Jesus down? Is that really what you're worried about? Is that really what you're worried about? Or are you worried that you might be looked at as a Christian? Because when you're looked at as a Christian, you're going to get judged a lot. I remember hearing one lady tell me that her son was so mad at her because, well, you know, your family, you know, you, these people that you hang out with, these Christians, they're the first ones to go out here and tell a dirty joke. Really? And what about you? Where are you at? You know, as Christians, it's not about us. It's not about me, you know, or how I, how you look at me and see me. But it is more about how God sees you and God sees me. Okay? Don't look at the speck in your brother's eye when you got a plank in yours. If you won't even assemble in the name of Jesus Christ because Mercy's sakes, those hypocrites are in there. If you're going to say those hypocrites in there and you're going to look at yourself and say, well, I'm better than they are. I got bad news for you. You're just as bad as we are. If you're a hypocrite today, if you're a hypocrite that tells people, I don't have to go to church because all them crazy hypocrites that go in the building, I've got bad news for you. You are doing exactly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. You are going and trying to pull the speck out of your brother's eye when you got a plank in your own. Take time out to remove the plank in your own eye and allow yourself to go. And if there is problems in the congregation, that means you go and be a part of the congregation. That means you get involved with the congregation. That means you help your brother with the plank in their or with the speck in their eye after you've gotten the plank out of your eye. See, that's what families do. We take care of one another. We build one another up. That's what we are supposed to do. And that is what these people are doing. They are building one another up. They are allowing God to work, even in the midst of bad situations, even in the midst where people are judging them, even in the midst when there could be death at their door at any point in any time. They're still there, and they're still preaching the word. I'm impressed that these disciples, while certainly shaken by the news that Peter and John's report brought, they request boldness and ask God to look upon these who are foolish enough to stand against God's plans and go and do as he sees fit, not them. And there is at least one stated reason why the disciples were able to have the boldness to trust God. They realized that God was in charge and realized that God would be victorious. This morning at service, we talked about reading the end of the book. When we go into Revelation chapter 22, we see the victory. We see the, the uh, stream that's coming from the throne. We see the stream of living water. And on each side of that is the tree of life. And the tree of life is bearing all these different fruits, all different seasons of the year. And we don't have to worry. We don't have to stress. We don't have to, we, we've earned rest. We've earned heaven. And it's not earning heaven by what I do. It's not going there. Our heaven is earned by Jesus Christ. Our glory is given by Jesus Christ, not by our works, not by our deeds. We are earned to heaven through Jesus Christ. It is only through Jesus Christ that we have hope. It is only through Jesus Christ that we have a means to get to heaven. And that is exactly what these disciples are praying. These disciples are saying, we know you've won the victory, and you've won the victory for us. And we are going to trust you, and we are going to go and risk our neck that much more. When we remember that God is in control, then I no longer have to worry and trust and, and, and doubt what's going to happen next. Mercy's sakes, in America, we've got an election coming up. We've got an election coming up within the next few weeks. And 
everybody's scared to death what's going to happen. Is it going to be more rioting afterward? Is it going to be more fighting? Is it going to be more violence? I've heard words like civil war break out again. I don't want to ever hear those words again. No one wants to hear those words. But you know what? We as Christians have something that a lot of the world does not. We have hope and we have a promise. We have a promise that God is in charge, that the creator of the world is in charge. He has more power and more knowledge than any of us have to deal with any circumstance that we may find ourselves in. And thus, it is imperative, it is essential for us to quit worrying and give it over to Him. Quit worrying and give it up to God. Keep doing what we need to do Keep being the Christians we need to be and don't worry about the outcome because God's going to be blessed through it. If we stand with Jesus and if we go and recognize the word as it is written and allow it to guide our actions. We must also realize, as these disciples realize, that no one, no one can stand against God and prevail. The disciples had no fear of Herod or Pilate, the Sanhedrin, or any other persecutor that was going to plot through against God's will. They didn't have to worry. There is nothing more futile in life than to plan against God and live without God. Atheists find that out soon enough, unfortunately. They can go and they can argue and they can fight and they can fume and they can fuss about that all they want to. They can fight against God all they want to. But in the end, when it's all said and done, just as Philippians 2 says, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Maybe not in this life, but definitely. Definitely in the eternal side of it, yes. Yes. Since God is all-powerful and almighty, why do we conspire and rage against God? Why do we plot futile and vain things? If we are not planning and working according to the purposes of God, we are wasting our time and our lives on this earth realization of this fact gives us boldness to stand against those who stand against God actively. And we can overcome. Look what happens at the very next verses here when we start realizing that this shaking and this boldness has come loose of the Spirit. In verses 32 to 35, we read more about the unity of the multitudes of believers in that first century. At the end of verse 32, it sums it up saying that the believers had everything in common. They were united. All of them were united in one name, in one body, in one belief, and that was in Jesus Christ. And with that, the first century Christians shared all they had with one another. Notice all that is described in this text that these believers had in common. First, they were of one heart and one soul. The believers were joined together relationally. They were a family. Their hearts were together with that, with that deep care and concern for each other that comes from being a part of a family. Their lives were joined together. They were not mere acquaintances who met together on Sunday. They weren't people that did it once a week. They had a joint participation in each other's lives. I recognize it is hard for us to get together every single day in the name of Jesus. But there is one thing you can be promised. One thing is that we can share in each other with unity through prayer through that continual connection of the spirit and allow God to hear our voices together in praying for one another and building one another up you don't have to go and and meet together for lunch or go and do anything like that you can just talk online or call somebody on the phone whatever the case is we today in this technological society that we live in today can go and reach out to people who need the love of Jesus Christ 
we can make differences that 2,000 years ago they couldn't even imagine doing. We have that capability. What's stopping us from doing it? Secondly, no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. Not only were they joint believers, joined together in heart and soul, but they also worked together financially. They built one another up. They were willing to take care of another and help the believers who had need. There wasn't any of this, well, I don't know if they need it or not. I don't know if we should trust them or not. Oh, my. Uh, and you know, the budget just ain't looking like we can cut it. It wasn't none of that. They made sure the budget had it because if they didn't have it, they sold something and put it in there so that the budget did have it. Now, that isn't saying socialism. You know what that's saying? That's saying Christianity. Do we really need all that we have in this life? If I had to, I'd sell everything I had, be able to give it to the poor, and let the poor have it. Please, take it from me. And the reason being is because we've got to be able to encourage others. And those that are the least among us, those people that have the least among us, we best better be taking care of them because Jesus says if we ain't taking care of them, we ain't taking care of him. We need to be able to do whatever we can and not hold anything back. Possessions were sold to help the care of these believers. And finally, third, they were joined together in the grace of God. Through their belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and their obedience to the will of God, these believers experienced the grace of God in their lives. We have a commonality in Christ that we can share with one another. It is something unique around all relationships in all religions. We are the ones that can do this, that can come together in that manner of like precious faith. And no deeper connection and no deeper spiritual bond or foundation can be found than with Jesus Christ that we share with one another. It is not easy to go and, and, and take that step or even a simple step to become united together to the degree that we're reading about as these first century Christians are. It's one of the hardest things that we could ever do because there are people that are going to fight you tooth and nail because their way is the highway instead of it being Jesus' way. Yes, we are to be reserved. Yes, we are to use common sense. But one thing is for certain. We are to allow Jesus to be seen in everything we do. Everything. And that means just as the first century Christians come unified, so too we should strive to. It is easy to simply give the friendly hi and how are you salutations to one another on a weekly basis. But it is a whole greater challenge to go and become united together in heart and in mind. It is hard to trust one another, ain't it? I've seen that firsthand and I've seen it go wrong sometimes. But what do we do? We press on. We keep striving forward. We keep having all things in common with one another. What prevents us from being joined together like these Christians? Well, there's a lack of time together. One of the first problems we encounter is that we don't spend enough time together. We don't spend enough time to get to know one another. We only pass by a couple of moments together a week and say, hey, how you doing? That's not the way we grow in Christ. I know I am more closely knit to those who I see on Sunday morning, who I talk to on Sunday nights, who I see maybe on a Wednesday night at a Bible study elsewhere. I know I'll be connected with those people in a different level than I would for somebody just I say, hey, how you doing on a Sunday morning? We do not only need to meet together for our scheduled worship hours, but we also need to take time together for us to be together and be a family, whether that is coming together on Sunday nights in Bible study or whether it is coming together as 
Christians on a Wednesday night and praying with one another. Or maybe we go and have a Bible study at somebody's house and we build each other up that way. It doesn't have to be something organized. Shoot, you can go and make you a pot of chili and go over to your buddy's house, who you go to church with, and spend some good old fellowship time with them, dipping cheese and peanut butter sandwiches in that food and having a good old time and being able to praise Jesus in that time. That is part of it. We need to spend time together. There is also a lack of trust, and this is one that gets all of us so hard. We need more time to socialize together so we can bring the trust to one another. We do not trust mere strangers, do we? But boy, what would happen if we actually got together and started getting together and talking together and worshiping together and following Jesus together? What would happen when we start meeting and assembling together? Only time together and thoughtfulness while together can bring down the walls and barriers so that we can have all things in common. These people, as Scripture says in Acts 2, said they met together daily. Are we meeting together daily? Are we trying to even meet together more than once a week? Are we doing everything we can to encourage one another? And then there's a lack of desire. And I think that this is one of the big ones. I think another reason we don't meet this New Testament example is because we just don't want to be like them. We're scared of it. We are perfectly happy, do, happy doing what we do, keeping our own schedules and worrying about ourselves to have to deal with working out to be with other people. No. That's not the way we should be. We are too busy, too tired to join with other folks. Sometimes we just want to be left alone instead of wanting to be joined together. But we are reading about a group of Christians here, a group of Christians that became a family together, sharing all things together, having all things in common. And it requires boldness on our part and in ourselves to open up to others so that we can get to know who we really are. And it requires boldness for us to open up our schedules and to be able to spend time with one another. Even if it's going and visiting a friend from the church building. Even if it is going and, and meeting the new folks that are a part of the congregation. Maybe take them a little something. Maybe cook you a little. I, know I talk a lot about food in here. You know, that's one of the things that helps unite us sometimes is food. That's not the only means by fellowship. You can go over there and take them any number of things. You can take them a, a welcome card. You can go over there and just sing a song to them, whatever you want to do, whatever God places on your heart to be able to encourage them. Be bold about it. Find ways to encourage one another, to spend time with one another and gain trust with one another. That's one of the main reasons we don't trust each other is because we're scared to and because we honestly don't think we have time. We desire our own time. I know I'm the same way. I would love to be able to have a day off and be able just to spend it with me. But you know something? That's not what God wants. God wants us to spend time with his people. And likewise, that's why I spend time with the church because the church is my family. The church is my spiritual family. Just as my physical family needs me to be a part of it, so too does the church need us to be a part of it. And so we need to be willing to spend time with one another, opening our hearts, opening our homes, and allowing people to see us and to have the acceptance of the brethren with one another. Let us be sure to do more to facilitate our own need for fellowship together so that we can become a model for Christianity as these Christians were in the first century. And let me tell you about one fellow in particular, and I'll end it tonight. I want you to think about this fellow named, uh, I want you to think about this fellow named Joseph. I want you to think about this fellow named Joseph for a moment, okay? Joseph, rather 
encouragement. You know, that's what his name was. They called him the son of encouragement, Barnabas. Barnabas was a Levite from Cyprus who also sold a field and laid money at the apostles' feet. We are not told in this passage the reason why our buddy Joseph was called encouragement. We do not get to hear any of his encouraging words, but we see his encouraging actions. We must marvel at the fact that this man clearly made it his mission to be an encouragement to those around him. Encouraging was the model of his life, so much so that they called him, not by his given name anymore, but they called him son of encouragement. Simply son of encouragement, Barnabas. I would also like for us to consider the boldness that is required to be a man like Barnabas. It takes boldness to take it upon ourselves to be the ones who will be an encounter of the saint, an encounter and an encouragers for all the saints. We take the low road when we become nags and nitpick every one and each other. We are like the world when we question people's motives, trying to find fault, looking to tear down, looking for reasons why we shouldn't give. But boy, have mercy. Look at what a true Christian looks like. Look at what they do. They do not give into the ease of murmuring and complaining and instead become encouragers. They become peacemakers. They become people who want to strive and want to serve and would be willing to give every single possession they had in order for Jesus Christ to be seen in the world. We need more Barnabas in the church we need more encouragement in the church. We need more encouragers in the church, not fault seekers, not people that are going to try to cause people to fall or cause people to be divided. No, we need people who are going to be united, that is going to build off of one another and help each other when there is weakness, not hurt each other. Why do we think it is our duty to find out what other people's problems are? We, why do we think that it has to be given to us to find faults with others and begin to swirl problems and difficulties and start murmuring? Why will we not be like Barnabas and try to help the person excel and become a better Christian through our actions? And I think it's because there are people today that think they've got it all figured out. Let me be blunt. None of us do. Not a single person. It is why you will never find a perfect congregation. You will never find a perfect group of people but you will see people like this first century church that will strive for it. Why don't we be more like Barnabas and excel to become better Christians ourselves? We show great boldness and truth in God when we help people overcome obstacles rather than become the obstacles ourselves. We act cowardly when we would rather talk to others about their weaknesses or about the weaknesses or other or start talking behind people's backs instead of going to the person and helping them or her, helping him or her do better in their lives. Are we wanting them to fail? Are we thinking that we'll be proven right if they do fail? Is that what we want? If that is what we want, then we are not living for Jesus Christ. We need to live for Jesus because we are not able. We are not able. But we know that in Jesus, we have courage. We have boldness. We can build people up. And it takes from us the willingness to do that, to let go of what we think is right and start embracing Jesus Christ, embracing our Lord, 
and being able to show Him. Let Jesus ooze out of every single pore in our bodies. I do not think there is anyone here who would say they do not need encouragement. I know I do. I know you do too. So let us be those kinds of people who will put courage into one another who will infuse courage in one another, who will help build one another, who will help unite one another. Let us look to each other to build one another up and not tear each other down. Let us look to help and find, and, and find truth, not fault. Let us do good to others even if they have wronged us. Let us forgive them. Let it go. It's not worth fighting over. It's not worth clinging to. There are three areas of boldness that we see in the closing section of Acts 4. We must first begin with the boldness of entrusting God. We cannot help others and be disciples of God when we have not put our full reliance upon God in the first place. Trust in God to carry you through your trials and your difficult circumstances. Jesus told us that we have no reason to worry when we put our faith in Him. Second, we need to have the boldness to have all things in common, every single thing in common with each other. It doesn't mean we're going to hit it perfectly. We're all different people, obviously. God did not leave us to be by ourselves and do God's will. He has commanded us to meet together, to be joined together, so that we can grow as individuals and as a congregation, and as individual congregations, to do what God's will is. We must dedicate ourselves to lower our defenses and not create fences that are going to keep everybody at arm's distance. Social distancing does not work in spiritual senses, okay? It might work to keep people well. Yes, that's fine. But one thing it isn't made for it is not made for spiritual. We need to lose social distancing in our spirits. When we do that, we become encouragers that God wants us to be. We can be like Barnabas, who saw the good in others, who wanted to do all they could, that tried to do their very best to help reach the goal of spiritual maturity in the Lord. Let us not be cowards who find faults. Let us not go and backbite. Let us not go and be children. But let us be bold to encourage each other to do better. Pray for one another. Help one another. Build one another. Don't hold back. Be willing to give your best to Jesus every single day. Every single day. Guys, I want to thank you for hanging out with me tonight. I want to thank you again for the encouragement of uh, being able to come and share the good news with you. Share this with your friends and your family. Be willing to go and tell others about that unique boldness that Christianity gives. And perhaps you're going to go on and find more of our studies on Acts. You can go to our YouTube channel. Uh, all you got to do is type in myllba.com slash YouTube. That's myllba.com slash YouTube. You'll find all the other Acts studies there. And while you're there, go ahead, hit the like, subscribe, and hit that bell for notifications. That'll keep you up to date to let you know what's going on. Okay. Also, if you've got any prayer requests, those are always, always prayed for. And I'll tell you, all you got to do is put it on there. You just got to put on there that you want prayer. You'll get it. You won't just get it from me, you'll get it from my family, you'll get it from the congregations at Greensburg and over at Mount Gilead and any other person I can get it into their hands because I want to be able to pray for you and pray for your needs. It is a gift of God to pray for one another and it is a gift of God to encourage one another.
and I hope I can encourage you that. Just visit down here on the link below. As said, you know, that's Brother Robbie, all one word. And Facebook, just feel free to share with me, like me, visit me, friend up with me. I'd love to talk with you. Love to talk with you. All right, guys. Thank you again for all your time. I ask that you continue to pray for one another and look to Jesus with boldness and with proud assurance of what he can do. God bless you.